Okay. We're connecting to our Zoom. And I'm also gonna make sure we start the recording for this as well. So you'll probably get a little notice. Awesome. And 6.03, so I'll just give it like one more minute and then I will kick off with some introductions. But um, thanks for everyone joining us and spending your Sunday afternoon, evening, I guess, um, here in this virtual space. It's really nice um, that you all have taken the time to be here. I really appreciate that. Where is everyone coming from tonight? I'm in Houston, Texas, personally. Feel free to use the chat for the mics. It's a pretty casual space. <laughs> I'm in Austin, Texas right now. Atlanta. Oakland, Phoenix. Nice. I'm currently in Wilmington, North Carolina. Great. We are across the whole country. Cool. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get things going. I have my notes here. I want to make sure they're in front of me. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. This is the 161st episode of Poets in Pajamas. Um, and I am so thrilled. Um, I'm SJ and my co-curator uh, Aslan Gossett is here as well. Um, and we're both just really excited to introduce the poets this evening. We're gonna do two 15 minute readings um, back to back followed by Q&A. Um, and so, uh, first is Bohi Moon. Uh, Bohi is a South Korean adoptee born in South Korea. She was adopted at three months old and grew up in Illinois. Her poems have appeared in Cha, Korean City Review, Gulf Coast, The Margins, Tupelo Quarterly, Zone 3, and others. Oma, Sea of Joy, and Other Astrological Signs, published by Tinderbox Editions, is her debut collection of poems and she previously published under a different name. Website, bohemoon.com. And uh, Bohe, before you begin, I also wanna give a note to folks for accessibility. If you want a copy of the written poems that are being read tonight, please reach out to our email address, poetsinpajamas at gmail.com. And take it away. Thank you so much for coming and thank you so much to Poets in Pajamas, your team, SJ Stout and Aslan Gosling, um, for curating this amazing event, a uh, Gasset, I'm sorry, Aslan Gasset, and Ashia Ajani. I can't wait to hear your poetry and read with you. Um, I did change my name legally to Bohi Moon to honor my heritage, and I previously published under a different name as SJ said, but I'm moving forward with Bohi Moon. So thanks everyone for your understanding. I'm going to be reading from my debut collection, Oma Sea of Joy and Other Astrological Signs, and some newer poems. And my poetry does contain abuse and trauma. I write about my identity as a South Korean adoptee, as well as healing from childhood abuse and the journey of reconnecting with life. I'm going to start with a poem called The Body After Trauma Desire. It's about um, re-inhabiting my body ex and experiencing my desire instead of running from it. And during the process of writing this poem, I really connect it with the way that desire is natural and it's a powerful experience, um, something not to disconnect from. The Body After Trauma Desire. Each flashback has a lesson. M dwarf stars are smaller, cooler, fainter than our sun and more active, explosively active, intense ultraviolet light. Having energy is the effect of my sovereignty. Often getting my attention, the sun falls and rises, markers to reset, the body stretching like a sore ankle in water. Do you ever catch yourself creating the same situations? More than anything, I want to be free of giving my attention to the dead stimuli, the effect I have on males flickering in my childhood neural circuitry, which is why I'm looking into stars and atoms. M dwarf stars take longer, longer than the other stars to form slowly, efficiently blazing. 
the body after trauma transformation. To love my body, I do the practical things. I notice the scent of my nature, my blood rich with minerals, my breasts relax, my black hair growing. My body has the mountain and the mountain's apples in her flesh. The pain of the past cannot be solved with a slow dance. Only a bit taller than me, his shirt soft red flannel against my cheek, I do not know him. I've held out the spoon, rib sauce on my cheek. My daily life involves not remembering Korean street language or the thoughts of a poor woman walking on a dirt road or what the brain told my body after being traumatized and re-traumatized. I'm changing out of these old clothes, which requires no effort and focus. I'm changing completely behind a rice paper door. How to love an adopted Korean girl. Take pictures of her in the dark when the moon is almost full on the verge of an eclipse. Ask her if she sees the rabbit. Show her there are two ways of looking at almost everything. She will find her way home by eating pumpkin porridge. She will realize her roots by remembering she came to America on tiny boat shoes. Her mother is beautiful, you know, because she was born from the same heartbeat and intelligence reserved for the soft spoken. Bring tangerines and light citrus spritz on fire to get a better look at her eyes. She will smell like forgetfulness and dank oil. The neck is a cradle. She will love you if you stay, if you promise you have never left. Um, part of my journey as a South Korean adoptee is I started searching for my birth mother when I was in my late 20s. And I also went back to my birthplace and volunteered at an orphanage near where I was born. I was trying to understand my roots and also what it means to be an adoptee. And I wrote this poem in relationship to that journey and part of my experience. An adopted Korean girl's babies in a South Korean baby's home. I will tie up my hair and stay sober with the cries of the babies in Naju. The pear orchard for Taurus is a temple where I won't feel bad for what I remember. A red bean rice cake in the pocket of a leather jacket, I walked away into the Midwestern wind, which we all do. I drink and smoke and eat. It's the closest thing to a high-speed train. Kim Jong is the tradition of preparing winter kimchi. Enough. I don't belong here or here or here but I will try to love you with clenched sleeping fists. On becoming a geisha girl, not a second wife. My father needed a new mattress for himself after my mother left. My father asked me what type I liked and made me sit on top of one in the store. I don't know why I asked you, he said days later. I remember the freckles on his back and the bag of beignets he brought me when I turned legal. We rested in adjacent beds at a New Orleans motel. I like firm goose feather beds now and men who listen to me just to know what I'd sound like stoned in a humid unknown city with absolutely no sense of where I'd like to sleep. An adopted Korean girl soberness. 100% Asia East, I bled and worried. I slept in the fetal position and learned how to eat a bony fish, how to chase love. A bruised moon is yellowed tinfoil. I was left with men like my father and a fistful of corn pops. What could I do but bleed? An adopted Korean girl's tea ceremony. Pouring tea for white men with bad teeth and bald spots, I want you to like me. My wrists turn upwards like leaves before rain. Come. There is weak, oiled light and spring rice you call flesh. I have a poem called BFF. It's a new poem and it's about friendship and also friendship with oneself. 
and relating to being a survivor. BFF. Back then when we both liked Chinese food but never talked about our birth mothers, I couldn't be honest. We met in Sunday school where you ate gefilte fish, which was before the synagogue disintegrated under the Cantor's prostitution ring. Remember the time when I sent you Bob Dylan song lyrics and said we couldn't be friends? I'm sorry. You never had a dog, a confidant to whisper, whisper to after your substitute mother suggested a boob job or your substitute father made sexual comments. I'm reading about incest studies. A woman picks up the phone, a stranger asking her, did a family member touch you? And she says that it did not affect her very much, but resists naming her father. Clingy and frightened, my first two weeks in America were difficult, though my adoption records say I got over this and appeared emotionally normal. If I am honest, I would tell you how scared I was because actually my substitute father was driving high on slick highways telling me I would never hurt you. And I'd be happy if you have a dog now who kisses your face after a good cry, whose breathing calms your own. And this will be my last poem today. It's called Practice for Living. And it's about my hope for not only my own liberation, but also the liberation of all little girls and children out there who deserve to be safe and loved in our world. Practice for living. A poet who loves peaches, melons, and possibly hunger writes me back a few words. What's sweeter is that a baby calls and a mother comes in the early light. Children giving names to the wild plum bark to their ghosts. You can't do anything, the child says. Blurry eyes mean a deep longing to go home, yet we're not sure what home means. Google says so. A friend surprises me with dark chocolate cherries. A poet shows me her dog in a small, fluffy cloud. Therefore, time isn't what we think. Almost lifting from the body, a woman's soft brown hair is flying through the woods. We talk of cures and a yellow bird. Falling into me is the taste of lime, a laugh I love. We all want just a little more time in the presence of what is not yet known. Closer to those who have the hunger, some call it that, for the sound that is us, the place, her room, our table. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bohi, for sharing your work. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, looking forward to the QA. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Ashia Ajani. Ashia Ajani is award-winning Black storyteller and environmental educator hailing from Denver, Colorado, Queen City of the Plains, and the unceded territory of the Cheyenne, Ute, Arapaho, and Comanche peoples. They are 2022 Just Buffalo Literary Fellow and co-poetry editor of the Hopper Literary Magazine. Ashia's work explores the complex layered relationship between the Black diaspora and natural built environments. Their words have been featured in Atmos, Sierra Magazine, World Literature Today, and Ap Apache Journal, among others. Ajani's debut poetry collection, Heirloom, is forthcoming with Right Bloody Publishing in spring 2023. Most days, they can be found grass side sharing a cup of coffee with the sun. Thank you. Take it away. Thanks, y'all. Um, thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Bohi. It was such an honor and a pleasure to hear you read. I love your cadence also, too. I like That's one of my favorite thing about like hearing poets read is just like the personality behind the words. So um, it's an old bio, so it is here. <laughs> um, 
and it did come out. It is out in the world. Heirloom is available. Um, I have copies on my website if people are interested, and you can also get it at your local indie bookstore. Um, I'm going to be because I'm following like kind of like a similar format as Bohe. Um, I'm going to read a couple of new poems and then some poems that are in um, the collection. The first poem that I'm actually going to read is um, a forthcoming in a, a Black Joy anthology, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. And it is called Edifo uh, Ecotropism, which is a very hard word. Um, and it is as you know weird of a concept as it sounds like, where um, a tree can absorb an inanimate object um, if it, it can like grow around it um, long enough. So yeah, I'll go ahead and get started. Also, I am in my pajamas. It's kind of, like, kind of hard to tell because my pajamas is just kind of like an oversized shirt, but I heard poets in pajamas, so I am like technically in my pajamas. <laughs> All right. At dawn, I am a buzz with yearning. I dust the pollen from my legs, eager to be enveloped once again in your precious nectar. The mirror reflects what I am while I sculpt myself into who I could be. A tree can grow around an object, engulfing hard metal in its wooden embrace. So I let desire wrap its tall arms around me and tether my eager appendages to its ever expanding anatomy. Before sun graces my window, lust awakens me. Though these two needs fill different hankerings, both make all life possible. And if I am granted a half hour glimpse of you at break, I feel the tree tightening its green grip. For you, I brushed myself into a dazzling creek, rusting an old oil can into memory, simply for a glimpse of your hand in an indirectly lit hallway. Like a dazzling touch me not, skeptical of any strange caress, but still unfurls its arms towards the warmth of a guiding star. Every morning was my creation story. I lined my mouth a glossy scarlet, erupting firecracker orange honeysuckle from a repatriated fence. Sweetness dripping with every pursed lip just for you. I showed you what the body can do when it is willing, knocking seasons from your limbs, restoring you brilliant, evergreen. One day they will carve into you, my love, as they do most brown things that have found a way to weather the worst impositions placed on rooted territory. Someone will take an ax to this gentle body, challenge you to split at the core. Maybe the steel will chip away at the miracle of our figures intertwined. Maybe my tough spine will spill enough sap to dull whatever blade tries to slice through our verdant haven. And maybe, just maybe that won't be enough. For now, embrace me as I grasp at your flavor. Come lay the sparkle of your starlit smile against my paintbrush tongue and watch how a concrete jungle springs a new well of color. All right, so this next one is going to be a little bit of an <laughs> emotional whiplash because this next one is definitely a lot more intense. Just a heads up, um, this one is a poem about um, cycles of violence, and it's one of my favorite poems in my collection of heirloom. I feel like it's almost kind of like the linchpin poem connecting a lot of the other themes and concepts that I speak about in the collection, and it is called Life Cycle. America is a factory. My father builds security cameras from discarded junk phones, their cracked screens, a subterranean stained glass burgeoning blessings. Come one, come all if you dare. He welds a fine line between surveillance and security. My father is no stranger to a gun. My father believes in a self-proclaimed rapture. The hills have eyes. My father's lenses thicken as his vision differs, defers. At the end of the world, he hopes to patent his despair. America is a landfill. Underwater bloodline brined, it soured. My neighbor pours the leftover liquid from a pot of greens into his garden. Billowing green stink arises, stains room for ripening. Black folks despise waste. 
the last drops of crown peach in the dog's water bowl for taste. Plastic bags under my auntie's kitchen cabinet, exceptional cushioning for our endangered shadows, never afforded the softness of packing peanuts. Is the soul biodegradable? Can it be upcycled? At least we still have granny's house. Wrap your apparitions in polyester coves, send them out to ocean. May they forever exist in sedimentary purgatory float, floating on. In this sense, we never rest. In this sense, pollution profits. And won't these white folks come and pick up the damn trash? America is a false idol, all my people iconoclasts. Look out the window at all that, goddamn, what is he protecting? Ain't nothing here ours but scraps of metal melted all down, why don't you? Some homes are worth less than their copper pipes, this metallic stew pot boiling over. My ancestors bartered their gold teeth for green, earned heart disease and curdled cream dreams instead as the planet warms another degree. Mama says my degree won't save me. Suppose cash really does rule everything around me. I wonder what rich bones can broth a new vanguard. America is a malignant tumor. Oh, how I long to capitalize this intrusion in our collective heartbeat, beating away at the floorboard of good senses until the spirits rattle around pushing daisies. Memory stinging nettle unsilenced. Watch the good earth reclaim clunkers for cash. Nostalgia makes a mockery of present. The open face sores on my uncle's knuckles a tribute to this nation's success. I won't bullshit you. He reeks of burnt sienna and ember. It all reeks of pirated pyrite. Fool's gold. I talk too much about my grandmother's hands because they threshed this country. Great migration granny built Ford tough. A gorgeous ghost gnarled into graphics. Look closely. You can see flakes of calluses soldered to your car's lithium battery. I talk too much about my grandmother's hands because they became cracked by bleach, ammonia, everything meant to whiten and purge, purge bacteria. She passed down her genealogy of anguish lead heart and blood, black lung coughing up embattled blues. Wasn't the tin man once chopping through scorched earth too? My gut is filled with vengeful microorganisms. Today and every day beyond grief, I throw my grease against any surface in need of shine. America, define yourself a country exactly. Am I offering a knotted bellyache of sadness born beyond a destined horizon manifested? The embers of our lost selves tumbling across the West Coast. Even the mountains seem to collapse with sadness. The spine of the uninherited earth curved like that of a funeral wailer. An assembly line aggravating access. All that rust corroding our good sense. Riddle me this. How can I be well when my lawn is always burning? All right, I have, da -da -da -da. I have three more poems. One is a little bit shorter. Um, this next one, I do want to give a content warning for um, white supremacy and uh, vigilantism, um, white violence. Um, this is a poem I dedicated to Ahmaud Arbery, who was gunned down by white supremacists in Georgia as he was on a run. Once again, I return to the outdoors in search of cleaner breath. My lungs, a peripatetic duo foraging for whatever fills, collapses or relieves. In the South, breath is heavy. Humid palpitations mark this flesh ripe for taking. This exhalation is not cheap. The flight in these legs, a vestigial burden passed down generations of restlessness. We stay moving. It is harder to kill a thing in constant motion. I say no names for fear I will summon something wicked. I do not look at what hunts me. Rather, I embrace the freedom of exodus. When one of us runs, the rest follow. It is an unspoken bond of reluctant prey. You would think with everyone trapped in their houses, the predators would take a break. Even Jesus got one day of rest. Two bullets hunt and run behind me. The asphalt loves this body too much for return. Whiteness rewrites my breath into blood, into ash. 
self-deputized by whatever golden emanations they deem worthy of judgment. These violent beasts reclaim open space that was never theirs to covet. My feet shift with a sole desire to mind my business and keep it pushing. My heart, a rustle in the wilderness sought for horrific consumption. I do not want to be surveilled. I just want to feel the cool air wrapped around my black body and for once, feel free to exhale. Thank you. Um, this next poem is, it's about like, I don't know, I don't even know what it's about. It's just like this hodgepodge of spirituality and migration and air and uh, stress and carcinogens and really is a great summation of all the weird ways that my mind works and makes connections. So it's uh, based off of this like house spray that is really popular kind of like at Botanica's. I don't know if it's like really in like normal, regular like grocery stores, but it's called um, Nine Indian Fruit Oil Money House Blessing. And it's like comes in this purple spray bottle um, and it smells horrible, but it's one of the few things that will actually cover cigarette smoke. So it's like very nostalgic for me because it reminds me of my auntie's house. Um, and the poem starts off with an epigraph um, from Rex Nettleford. Um, where he says, Anansi, who is a um, trickster spider um, in West African diasporic mythology, and, and also really, um, I think, uh, different, uh, makes different appearances in Caribbean and like some kind of like Southern like diasporic mythology. But the epigraph says, Anansi admirers will probably reply that in order to cope with an unstraight and crooked world, one needs unstraight and crooked paths. One, the dead harmonize. Invocation of one brings many, each tongue a split cipher. Since stuck to Southern summer steam, nine fruits, Virginia slims, cat food, Folgers, propane, plastic wrapped furniture, old cognac, nail polish, body heat, the dead red of summer, ceiling fan blowing the same hot air around in circles. Disclaimer, curio only, two, two, two. The Lord gon' bless me today. My bones look better at the end of the world cut off from flesh, a headless ghost or only a head severed from ancestral body, obscure enough to let most anything and everything in, clear as dishwater. Don't we all just look the same? Oh, don't you know we got a little bit of everything in us? Can you use some creative license? Those memories are best kept in a lockbox on the vanity. Three, Anansi learned to shape shift by washing distorted tides of the Atlantic, his long body salt stained, trickster shorn skin patched together bloodline remnants for new regalia. Fragrance always signals a return, massages memory. Roots stretching east, both planted, displanted, fruit from nowhere and everywhere at once. Four, when a culture is preserved, is it pickled? Is it smoked, frozen, vacuum sealed? Does it lose its sazon in an effort to prevent spoilage? Does savagery stay put or just evolve with the times? Does the scent of God linger on our fingertips still? Five, agua, propelente, fragrancia, estabilizadores, conservadores, collapsed fruit stuck to dehydrated lineages. What remains is diffusion. Six, dispersed carcinogens intermingling. Breath is a necessary sacrifice to be had for a small blessing. Golden ghastly spray, borrowed time anyways. Seven, modified for survival, the story changes every seaport. Canning culture, umbilical cords buried under provision grounds. If we can't source, we invent. If we can't invent, we release to the breeze time after time. Eight, there remains a fine line between enlightenment and entertainment. We built a nest in this hell, anointed it with the dead matter behind our gums. Eyes plugged flush dark by a landlord who says he can only be responsible to what he sees. Nine, I disagree. In her final years, my great mother's world didn't extend beyond her porch. Her eyesight wanes. She has seen enough. Incense smoke carries her blossoms eastward. 
All right. Thank you again so much for having me. I'm really excited to get into this Q&A. Um, but I have one more poem before we move into it. And this is a new one. This one isn't in the collection. Um, and it is about my love for weird sea creatures and also roller skating. And they relate somehow. <laughs> so <laughs> here we go. Silhouettes become me. I have no affinity for harsh lighting. I prefer the way shadows distort time, how ocean waves stretch bodies like duppies bowing out of this world and the next. Even when the moon hits blue black just right, salt slips from sleek backs, returns to a collective seawater, homeostasis. I wanted to dissolve into dark like that, home in the mouth of Yemaya. I glide over her tongue and tuck my bell bottom so they don't get caught in infinite wheels. A mermaid's tail. I became an animal transported by narrative. The first time at the roller rink felt like school. Every gathering a chance to feed ancient rhythms sunk to ocean floor. Polished wood anointed with sweat, self-guided ablutions. I recalled what it meant to be free and glistening, more bend than bone more inlet than isolation, saddling the curved dark of purple bodies, gliding to the sound of their own music, technologies of survival scattered across sand. Dawn's light breaks our midnight shuffle like cops cutting through a crowd. Cartilaginous creatures wash up on shore, beaten by waves. They refuge in the tide pools of my chest. I too find myself gasping for breath, for return, this could be burial, a collapse of lungs deflating the ego, paint blue of our veins warding off unwanted predators. What God could ignore this? Your hands around my waist guiding migration to warmer waters, where grief and gratitude burn at the far end of a backwood. Let the open womb of the sea reclaim us. Let us make portals out of gills. Thank you. Awesome, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Shia, for sharing uh, your work. I love all the places that it took us. Um, and I do encourage everybody listening in to unmute or use the chat to uh, drop a question to the poets. Um, one question I always like to kick things off with um, that Aslan and I, you know, other people might be familiar with this one, but I'm always curious, you know, what's on your bookshelf? Um, what are you reading these days and what's inspiring you that you're reading? And that's for both of you guys. I went to a book exchange party and I got Easy Beauty. I loved reading this book. And then also right now I'm reading this issue of The Sun and I loved a nonfiction essay called The Psychic Is In. It was so good. And then I also am reading this book of Zen poems that I got from the library. Oh, that's so dope. I love, um, I've never heard of like a book exchange party before. I've like done like clothing exchange, but like book exchange just like makes so much sense. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to tune into that. Uh, I recently started reading um, Saltwater Demands a Psalm by Kweku um, Abiola, I believe is his last name. Um, I think I'm pronouncing it wrong. Um, Abim Abimbola, Abimbola. Um, and I just really like, yeah, it's a fantastic collection. I was just like, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like one of those like, like collections that just like really arrests you with like the expansiveness of language and the expansiveness of experience. Um, and he's also just like, just hella talented as like a, as a writer and in, in the ways that he sees the world, which is really cool. And I'm kind of, I'm kind of like lukewarm, like halfway so gearing up to like do the Sealy challenge, which I've never done successfully. And the Sealy challenge is you're supposed to read a poetry book, you know, like once a day, like uh, for the entire month of August. Um, and I, every year I make it like maybe to like August 10th. 
if I'm lucky. And then I'm just like, I can't do this anymore. So I plotted out the books that I'm going to read there. Some ones that are on my list are What Noise Against the Cane, um, Miseducation um, by Eric Francis. Um, that's a lot of poetry books. Uh, again, which is why book exchange is so important. That way you can like, you know, like get like and, and, and see all the different uh, work that's out there. Um, and then I also have um, How to Make an Algorithm in a Microwave um, by Maya Salome, I think is um, her last name. Uh, Salome, Salome. And I'm really looking forward to that. Um, this feels like so... Um, boring but I've been doing a lot of um research for some long form work that I'm doing so a lot of my reading has just been like scientific articles lately so I'm really looking forward to getting back into more like books and literature uh yeah book exchange just blew my mind because why is that I've never that's never occurred to me before um yeah, cool. I'm I'm taking my notes. So thank you guys for sharing the titles and the ideas. Um, I also hadn't heard of that reading challenge before. Um, I like that it's it's challenging enough though that like I kind of want to do it just because it sounds so ridiculously difficult to read a single like a poetry book every single day for that many days. Um, and that's I'm like oh I should try. Um, so thank you for bringing that to to our attention. Um, um, I guess another question, I'm not seeing any in the chat yet, um, and I might just double check Facebook as well, because I know some folks are over there in that uh, domain, but um, it could, both of you also kind of just as an introduction, kind of sh share your path to poetry. Have you always been writing poetry? Did it start in another genre? Um, Ashia, you mentioned long form. Is that always been adjacent to yeah, I'm just wondering, like, what, how did you kind of come into poetry and find your stride in poetry? Um, I know, for, just because you mentioned it, you know, I know for me, long form, I don't know if it like came before, but I've always like loved writing. Writing had just been a mode, an important mode of self-expression for me for since I was like young, I'm an only child. Um, so, you know, a lot of it was just like spending time by yourself and then like learning how to talk to yourself <laughs> in some ways um, because you don't have like other siblings or um, all your family's like way older than you and you know you're a kid. Um, so I really kind of, I guess, like got a more like formal start when I did slam in high school. I was on um, a youth poetry team and that was really awesome because I got to meet and connect with other um, young people who were doing poetry. And then um, after that, I went to college and I also joined like a poetry group there and was just really interested in the different ways and I'm continuing to discover like different arenas that poetry can take you into. Um, so, yeah, I think that was like kind of like the the most like the way if I'm tracking it, like that's the way that I'm thinking of. But I find like poetry also like imbues a lot of my other practice. I'm an environmental educator, which basically means I spend a lot of time talking to high schoolers about climate change and garden maintenance. Um, but I find like poetry and storytelling are also like really useful tools in that environment. And then also on the flip side, um, I, in terms of my long form writing, a lot of people have said that like my long form writing is very poetic too. So I, you know, I see it pop up in other places. Also, this is my cat, Cholula. She's come to join and hang out. Hi, kitty. Yes, oh, it's great to see your kitty. I also resonate with what you were saying, learning how to talk to yourself. That resonates a lot with me. I feel like with poetry, it, captures my attention and it also really resonates with my energy and the way that I naturally move and the movement of my mind and also how I physically move in the world. Um, so I feel like there was always a connection to poetry. It also grabbed me when I was beginning to really explore being a Korean adoptee and asking myself difficult questions like, who was my birth mother? How can I start searching for her? What does it mean to be an adoptee? How do I find my way back to Korea? And poetry was a way where I was really able to speak to myself about things that had previously been taboo or had been something that I felt like I needed to keep silent. And through poetry, my actual true voice came to me. 
and what I needed to know about my own experience, but also the questions that I had um, in relationship to being an adoptee. So the poems helped me to figure out, okay, I do really have deep questions about my birth mother, my roots, where I come from. And it, it spurred some of my research to find the village where I was from and to phys physically go there. Um, it also helped me with my therapeutic healing process because as an adoptee, I also um, had great help of a therapist who helped me out in that journey too. And so poetry and other modalities of healing really allowed me to connect with uh, my deeper voice. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's interesting how you say like, poetry also helped you connect just to the way you already move through space or like how you move through the world. And I think it's really interesting to draw that connection between like the body as well. It's not just this sort of um, literary, wordy, mental game, right? That like, I think that we want to like bifurcate things all the time, right? So it's the idea of like, it's something that has to do with like, you're uh, something that's a little bit more holistic about who you are and how you move through life. Um, it's just nice to, to hear that and like kind of be reminded that poetry is um, so embodied. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you guys both for the, the answers to that. Do we have any questions from any of our listeners? I've got one. Um, Ashia, you noted on it earlier, uh, with the word cadence, which is spot on um, for Bohi's reading, but also for your own. And so the question is, is to both of y'all. Um, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm very interested to, uh, to always hear how poets come up with the way that they're going to read a poem. Uh, you know, we sit there and we write out the words on the page and it's like, oh yeah, like, this is awesome, or I hate this, I need to, you know, but until you say it out loud, it's hard to get a sense of how the words are going to fall on the ear. And even then you say it to yourself and it says, you know, comes across one way, you say it to somebody else. And because they have no familiarity with what's to come, it can be surprising. Um, so I've always found it hard to develop, say, like, the right speed that I want to read, or tonally, like, there are certain poems that I think uh, I've heard completely atonal, and that changes the whole mood of it. Or like Ashita, your work is just full of personality. It's like, it's conversational in a way that it is, it's informative, it also feels comforting, it feels confrontational at times, like the way that you bend the words and speed up and slow down. Uh, Bohi too, um, yeah, I think it was maybe your second poem, where you could feel like the rush from the end of line to end of line, kind of like just zooming through and then slowing down. So this is all to say, how do y'all approach um, learning the, the cadence that you're going to perform with, or do you just let it come to you? Do you let the kind of reading inform itself? Did you, did you want to start, Bohi? I didn't know if you wanted to. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was waiting. Do, uh, do you want to go first? I think I'm still putting together my thoughts, if you have something, but also no pressure. I wanted to sit and, and think together. <laughs> oh, sure. Aslan, that's such a thoughtful question. So thank you for asking it. My, my approach is um, I do it intuitively. So like the way that I selected these poems, it just felt right for me to put these poems together. And I felt like this reading uh, with Poets in Pajamas is so special. Both of you are so uh, supportive in bringing artists and poets together and supporting diverse voices. So I knew it would be a special place. So I picked the poems um, based on the event and the feeling that you create with this series. Um, and then as far as the pacing and the rhythm, I read them out loud by myself and I just feel it out and feel 
um, the speed, what feels natural, the music of the words and how they flow together. So with the second poem, I could feel, um, I didn't use periods with my black hair growing, my body has a mountain and the mountains apples in her flesh. I could just feel that coming together and rushing the way life sometimes rushes through you or like a river rushes through land and brings life within that area. That was the energy that I was feeling. And so I think that's why there wasn't punctuation there. Um, but then there is kind of a meditative pause later. And I think that sometimes in life, that's how I experience things. Like I love the natural environment and I love feeling alive and connected to nature and connected to my body. But then I also combine that with stillness and going into contemplation and thinking about um, everything that I've experienced and how to reconnect with life in order to be more empowered. And so I think that's why in that poem, there were also moments of stillness and pausing. Yeah, thank you, Rohi. Um, calling in to other practices as well, you know. Um, I think for me, like, I come from a very musical background. So, like, I grew up playing piano, like, I compose and things like that. So I think that music plays, musicality and rhythm plays, like, a really important role in a lot of what I'm writing. It's also important for me to, like, sound like myself. I think that there's a lot of poetry in, like, African-American vernacular English and also in, like, different mythologies and different, like, rooted in ancestral practices. So I think that there's like a natural rhythm and a natural like musicality that kind of shines through because of a lot of the things that I am writing about. That being said, I think also coming from my like slam background, like writing something on the page and then reading something out loud, it can be like two completely different things, right? And like, I, that's really important for me to like read pieces a lot before I perform them and in the process of performing them because I feel like po my poems are constantly evolving. And even though like I may like, like how it looks on the page when I read it out loud, like I might like pause here in a way that like maybe that doesn't align with that line break or I might um, just take out a word or switch it out for a new one that I like a little bit better. Um, and I just kind of like to keep playing with that and not seeing like poems as like these fixed objects that exist on the page but are like ever evolving as like I evolve as like a speaker and a performer and a writer and so I think being able to be like flexible with it um it's like you know when um also this is like on my brain because I was like talking to my friend about this earlier today but like you know it's like when you go and see Beyonce and like the show that Beyonce is going to put on in Detroit is not the same show that she's going to put on in Houston which is not the same show that she's going to put on in Santa Clara you know so being able to like think about it like that as I'm like performing my poems I think has been very liberating and has also like helped me with a lot of like self-doubt and like self-critique it's like you know these um these these are my babies but they're also like you know like babies and like toddlers you know, like you know like they're going to grow they're going to like rebel they're going to do what they want to do uh, and then they're going to transform you know into and keep transforming hopefully Absolutely. Thank you all so much. Th those are exquisite answers. Um, and I love the, the Beyonce anecdote is perfect. <laughs> like, I would never have thought of it that way. But that is absolutely true. Um, feeling out the, the vibe, uh, feeling whatever energies are kind of coming into you at a certain time with the people around you. It's why, why, why try to push that away? Like, there is always that element of listening to like, um, what is the room trying to tell you? What, what is that inspiring in you and how you perform it? And then also, um, I like the note too about the innate musicality uh, of the words themselves and sounding like yourself. Um, I think we all know, or like I've been to readings or something where someone reads something just a little awkwardly and it feels very forced. So I think it is always beautiful to, um, to be reminded of that too, like to not lose yourself in the attempt to perform something a certain way, uh, always making sure to check back in. Um, so thank you both so much for your, for your answers. All right, if we have time for one more, um, I would like to ask one more and I'm, I'm just gonna um, keep this going just a little bit longer. Um, so the other thing I'm really curious about is, um, Shia, you're an, an environmental educator. Um, and Bohi, you just mentioned loving nature and I'm like 
my brain's a little bit here too, because my day job is in communications for an advocacy group that does, we do a lot of environmental advocacy. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm kind of curious in the environmental communication, climate communication space, there's a lot of like stereotypical things that just get repeated, right? Like you hear the same things over and over again. And it's, it's hard to do the work because you're just like hit with like, okay, we've got, you know, emissions, we've got, you know, extreme weather, we've got, it, it, you know, just the same, like, it's a lot. And so you're constantly communicating about that and figuring out, well, how do I communicate about, how do we talk about climate change? How do we, you know, talk about nature? There's a lot of criticisms with nature writing. Who's doing the nature writing? Who's, what is nature? Who's describing it? What is in nature? What counts? I mean, there's obviously just, it goes on and on. Um, so I just was wondering, you know, maybe each of your all's take on that. Is there a pet peeves with nature writing that you have um, about, you know, any kind of nature writing that you maybe you you want to push back against? Um, or yeah, maybe that's my question is, do you have pet peeves with nature writing? Um, or what does nature writing mean to you? <laughs> Okay, mm, I'm like of kind of like two schools of thought. I feel like I have like my environmental educator school of thought. And then like, I also have like my creative side. Um, I, I think that, and this might be an unpopular opinion. I think that if you are looking to solely to fiction and poetry to as like um, pinnacles of achievement in terms of nature writing, I, and, and you're wanting to see like a very like, What's the word that I'm looking for? If you want to see a kind of like concrete analysis or engagement with nature, you're going to the wrong place. I think that that like poetry and fiction in particular and some nonfiction and some lyric essay, I see it mainly as like a way of reinvigorating imagination and, re and reinvigorating whimsy and awe. Um, also, you know, as like warnings, you know, there's a lot of dystopian fiction out there. There's a lot of like dystopian writing out there. Um, and I think of it also as a way of just like self-expression, um, enjoying engagement. I think that that's awesome. And I think that that's so necessary. Um, some things that I don't like, I don't really like very fatalistic writing. Um, I do. And when I say fatalistic, I don't really like writing that just kind of like assumes that we're going to end up in somewhere and that there is no way out. Um, I don't really like writing that is um very narrow in its view around how different people engage with nature um and i don't like nature writing that isn't well researched i think that it's really dangerous to be perfectly honest to like put forth concepts around like people's experience with nature engagements with nature making absolute like you know like boom 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 this is what it is i think that that's dangerous especially for um folks who might be like that might be your primary source of like thinking about and like envisioning and imagining nature if I think about it in terms of like kind of like more like on the environmental educator side of things, I love work that like really challenges you. I think I think that there's a difference again, considering the time that we're in. I think that there's a big difference between like climate change and nature. Um, and I think that that's a really important distinction, just as like, you know, when we think about like climate change as like, you know, the burning of fossil fuels or as the world getting warmer. I mean, biodiversity and climate change, I feel like sometimes there's a lot of like equating things that might be related, but aren't like, you know, exactly the same. Um, and so I really think that, you know, reinvigorating curiosity, whimsy, imagination, um, building like different futures, that's something that I really, really love because I think that it, it recognizes that there needs to be an expansive approach in understanding and thinking about, you know, like what nature and also what it means to experience nature under climate change. And I'm hoping that that makes sense. So I'll give some examples of like some like nature writing and climate change writing that I actually like really, really love. Um, Black, uh, Black, Black on Earth, I really love. It's a nonfiction book by Kim Ruffin. Um, and she it's, it very much is like heavy literary analysis. Um, I love, um, oh my God, it's an anthology by uh, Camille Dungy. It's like four centuries of Black nature poetry and, and the name is like um, escaping me right now. Um, I also really love Mother World, which is a collection of poetry by Destiny Hemphill. Um, I don't know if it would fall under like 
this like kind of like nature canon, but it is about environment and, you know, and, and relation um, and futures. Um, and I also think like sometimes some things that don't get classified as like nature poems or poetry, I feel like it's kind of racist. Um, so, so I'm going to put it in the category of, cause like that's how I view it. And, you know, that's how I interpret it. Um, and then I also love um, one thing that I feel like but doesn't get recognized is like Toni Morrison. Um, nature was like as much of a character as her uh, as her characters themselves. So I love a lot of Toni Morrison work um, around nature writing. And then I'm also making my it is dense. I'm not gonna lie, this book is dense. Um, but I'm making my way through climate lyricism um, by Min Hyung Song, um, and it's really really good. Um, they're a Korean writer and um, write just a lot and just like a really cool literary analysis. I think that there's a lot of cool stuff coming out um, with uh, nature writing, and I, I try not to be like overly critical, um, but I also do think that like given certain circumstances, like you are responsible for what you put out there. So <laughs> I'll like leave it at that. Thanks so much. I love what you're saying to you about reinvigorating the imagination. Um, what Where I gravitated was thinking what really strikes me and what do I absolutely love? Of course, Braiding Sweetgrass. I loved reading that book and the gorgeousness of the prose. Um, also, some things that I have loved are my octopus teacher. Have you seen that? And also, um, Touching the Wild, Joe Hutto, who he lived with um, mule deer and he lived with turkey. What I love about these different um, offerings to the world is that they each of them helped me to see something that I didn't see before. And that happened to me recently. I was reading a poem by my friend, Susan Nguyen, and um, it has the imagery of a flame um, that is seen within the color of foxes. And there, she had a line, and I might be misquoting this, but it was something like, each day is a revelation. And I went for a walk in nature, and I was thinking about her poem, and she helped me. I was just like meditating on that line and the imagery, and she helped me to see things differently. Like I walk the same path almost every day, and I noticed birds that I normally didn't see, and I felt like I was paying more attention. And so... I gravitate towards um, voices and pieces where it exposes me to an original and new way of seeing that makes me feel more alive. Thank you both so much. Um, I, yeah, I'm really invigorated by those answers. So thank you. Um, I feel like there's a separate like part two virtual uh, meeting we need to have just talking about this topic. Um, uh, it's really great to hear both girls' thoughts on it. Um, we are at the top of the hour, and this has just been such a pleasure to hear you all. It, both of your work is just, it's so beautiful. And, you know, hearing just the distinctiveness of your all's voice and the skill and the beauty that you write, both write with is um, a real gift. And so thank you so, so much for sharing that. Um, and I do want to, you know, thank the folks that tuned in as well. It's been really nice um, to have our, our listeners here and this is being recorded so folks can also hear this um, in perpetuity on the Poets in Pajamas Facebook page. Um, it's on behalf of Sundress Publications as well as Poets in Pajamas. Thank you all for coming. Our next readers are going to be on August 6th, uh, Chim Shirting and Grace McNair. August 6th from uh, 7 to 8 Eastern on this same Zoom channel. And folks can follow Poets in Pajamas Facebook page or our WordPress, poetsinpajamas.wordpress.com for more info and updates. So until then, um, Shia, Bohi, thank you both so much. Aslan, my co-host, thank you. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you all so much.